Hey, it's Jamie, and welcome to a selects edition of Eventual Millionaire. This is where we go back and find the best of the best, the ones that you've loved from the past six seven years. We've been doing this a long time and there's some amazing interviews with amazing guests that you have not seen yet. So we are bringing them back. It is the Selects Edition. Let us know what you think and I hope you enjoy. Potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Masters, and today on the show, we have Fabian Dittrich. He's awesome, and I can't pronounce the website very well, but we're going to try it anyway. It's called helpando.it, hopefully. He also runs startupdiaries.org, digital nomad type, and expert in serendipity. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thanks for coming on. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Okay, so pronounce or spell the name of the website so that way everybody is on the same page, because I'm sure I botched it. Okay, so just imagine the word help in English and then an A-N-D-O at the end. So it's helpando.it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now everybody can understand. So tell us what it does, though, because it's a really cool site. We are a service provider for um, uh, cloud-based customer service tools. So we help companies um, to improve their customer service by implementing cloud-based customer service tools such as Zendesk, Salesforce, Freshdesk, Kayako. It's funny, I was just chatting about this with one of my clients yesterday, and he was trying to clean up his time, and he's like, is Zendesk worth it? And I didn't have the answer to that. So you tell me, like, how big of a company do you need to be to have one of these tools? Well, Zendesk has like 85,000 different companies who are using Zendesk um, to give customer support to, to their customers. And there's small startups with maybe one uh, person working in support, but there's also uh, big customers like Groupon who have like thousands of, of agents, right? So there's not really a limit because you pay per agent per month. So if you're just a, a one-man startup, you can still get a Zendesk account and pay only, you know, one uh, agent per month. And uh, that might you cost as little as like 10 bucks per month. But uh, so there, there's not really a limit. Um, I guess it makes sense once you get contacted by customers over different channels. Like if, if you're just one person and you only get emails, it's fine. You don't need a customer support tool. But let's say you have a Facebook friend page. Let's say you have Twitter uh, and customers might mention you on Twitter. They might mention you on Facebook. So the, 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 the advantage of, of having something like Zendesk is that all these requests are centered in one central place. So if somebody mentions you on Twitter, it ends up in Zendesk. If somebody writes an email, it ends up in Zendesk. If somebody calls you, you can connect, you, you can pick up the call via Zendesk, right? You have 10 different channels, you connect to Zendesk and you only need to log into this one central place instead of logging into 10 different places. That makes so much sense. Maybe I should be implementing Zendesk because what we do right now is it's a little all over the place with customer service and I have an amazing customer service person, but still it's a little like trying to, to go crazy. I just assumed it was um, for longer type threads, right? So somebody without just one question, something trying to like problem solution type thing, not one call solution. You know what I mean? Yes. Is yeah, that... it's, it's, for, it's for everything, you know, sometimes in Zendesk everything is called a ticket. So if an email comes in, it's a ticket. And, you know, there's tickets you can solve with one response and there's tickets which sometimes have 120 uh, different responses. And I it think really I've depends been, on your business. I've been, because uh, I came from the tech world and all we did was tickets. And I think I have PTSD from that. So I think I've always <laughs> been like, I don't want tickets in my business because, oh my gosh, a pain in the butt. So how the heck did you get into this space? Because it's not like <laughs> I'm going to create solutions for customer service type software. Right. Yeah. And this is where the serendipity thinking uh, comes in, you know, and uh, it's hard to think where, where I should start to give you the long story uh, short. Uh, I think it started in 2006, I was uh, studying computer science and I had no idea how I would use any of what I learned to make a living. Yep. But I had a friend, um, uh, he, he, he's like 65, he's a retired dentist from Bulgaria and he uh, does this funny thing where he uses an old expired press card that he still has from like 10 years ago when he was like a journalist and he sneaks into these expensive conferences just to get the free food. For food. <laughs> smart man, so, smart man. Okay. So one day he calls me and I'm in university and he's like, hey, Fabian, I'm, I'm at this Ruby on Rails conference and the food is just about, the, the buffet is just about to start. It looks really good. You should drop by. 
And I was like, Ruby on what? You know, it's a programming language, but it was fairly new in 2006, so I didn't know what it was. But the free food sounded really good. So I went there, and then he brought me in with his fake press card. And uh, while I was shoveling all this salmon on my plate, there was, a, there was a recruiter standing next to me who was like, hey, do you work with Ruby and Rails? Are you looking for an internship or a job or something? And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, it was this, this fake it till you make it thing, right? And uh, they employed me. So the next week, I started working in this consultancy company, uh, and then two weeks, uh, uh, two days a week, uh, learning Ruby and Rails. And Wait, you, uh, you learned at the company, or you were trying to learn like crazy before you actually went in, right? Because yeah, you exactly. said yes. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I had one week, uh, so I went into the into the into the basics of Ruby and Rails. I mean, I studied computer science, so I was yes. fairly familiar with computer programming languages. Yeah, for sure. And Ruby and Rails is easy to learn. And it was just some sort of an internship. They didn't pay me a lot of money. So uh, the expectation was also not that high. So I, I learned Ruby on Rails at the job. And then I just went from company to company while studying. And at one point, I guess I, I knew Ruby on Rails. So I worked at an NGO. And one day, I walk out of the office, like 5 p.m., to go home. And there's this Spanish guy with long hair sitting on the streets in Berlin, like in front of a hostel. And he was playing a guitar. And it was exactly the guitar that I wanted to buy at that time, like a backpacker small guitar. So I walked up and said, hey, can I try this guitar? Because I'm thinking about buying it. And he's like, sure. So I'm sitting next to him playing this guitar. And while I'm playing, he's telling me this amazing story, how he met a girl at the beach in Barcelona, and then from one day to another decided to give up his, his house painting business, uh, sell all his stuff, and uh, fetched, uh, like picked up his passport from home told his parents to sell everything, and uh, she had a camper van, and she was on the way to Africa. So he joined and didn't come back for four years. So he, he drove through Africa in a camper van for about four years, only coming back like for a weekend each year to Barcelona, buy another car, drive it down to Gambia, sell it for three times the price, and then live with that money in Africa, like really low budget, right? He was like this kind of on the streets guy. So I'm like, isn't that dangerous, driving a car through Africa? He's like, no, man, you just, you know, you do this and this and this. And when the police stops you, you say this. And I'm, I, I was like amazed. And I, I thought, this is really an adventure. And, and, I, and I wanted to do the same, right? So two months later, I bought an old Mercedes and drove down through, you know, Germany, France, Spain, Morocco, Mauritania, Senegal, Gambia, Burkina Faso, Togo, Benin, Nigeria. Like basically the whole thing. I wanted to go to South Africa. So I end up in Congo and suddenly I feel really sick and I have this, like I'm shaking, I'm freezing, I have high temperature and uh, I had malaria. So I'm, I'm hosted by these two French, uh, like a couple uh, on couch surfing and, and I'm living in this luxurious uh, mansion that they got from some shell or something because they, they, they get out the oil for, 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 for petrol. And I'm shaking and freezing and, and really like hallucinating. And it's not, that's not a nice state of, of mind. So I'm trying to keep me busy to not, you know, uh, get sucked in by this fever deliriums. So I go on Google and watch like all sorts of funny cat videos and, and the, the craziest Guinness World Records just to do something. But one day <laughs> I literally type into Google the coolest job on the internet and I hit search. And the first result was an article on venturevillage.eu, which is like a startup news page in, in Germany, I think. And it was a job offer from a company called Zendesk in San Francisco. And I had no idea what they do. I didn't want the job. I was not looking for a job. I thought I would never go, go back into IT. And there was an online application form, like that long, like name, phone number, letter of motivation, like a multi-line text box, and upload your CV. The only thing I did was Fabian and my number in Congo. And then I hit submit, right? <laughs> it wasn't like mandatory required fee, so I could submit it anyway. So the next day, I'm slightly off the malaria thing. I get a call from the CEO of, of Zendes uh, from, the, from the European office. And they're like, why did you apply for this job? And I had no idea what I applied for, right? but I wanted to play along. So I improvised the whole thing. I went on like, Zendesk.com. Okay, customer service. Mm, okay, they need somebody with technical skills. Okay, I can do that. So I went on, I went on and on. And then the next day, somebody else uh, called me, and it really sounded like an amazing job. So they were like, when can you be in London? And I'm like, well, uh, I, in two weeks. 
and I had the car, so I had to I had to sell the car while still slightly on malaria, like waiting and shivering and forty degrees outside, like Celsius. Uh, it's really hot. That's like ninety five something Fahrenheit, I think. Um, selling this car to Africans who came late for four hours, and oh, it was horrible. But finally, I sold the car on the last day, like a couple of hours before boarding the plane, and then I flew to London. And I looked like crazy. I had a long beard. I had long hair. So I slightly shaved. And um, then they told me, when you walk into the office, just don't say hello. Just pretend you're a Zendesk uh, sales expert and we are your clients. And you pitch Zendesk to us, right? So I'm on the plane. And next to me, that's also really serendipity. There's a newspaper. And the front side story is the new face of customer service on that day, right? So I walk into the office and kind of throw the newspaper on the table and I say like, have you seen this? This is, this is, <laughs> you know, and made like this presentation where, oh, well, it was all for fun, right? I didn't really want the job. And then they said, dude, this was awesome. When can you start? And, they were, and I was like, yeah, in two months because now I have to go to South America first. So I went to the jungle, uh, came back and started working at Zendesk, right? And, um, this job was amazing. Like I loved it. I worked like 80 to 100 hours a week because I loved so much, you know, after one year of driving through Africa and not being productive in, in the typical sense, I was really happy to, to be productive again and cross things off my to-do list. So I really kind of made myself indispensable in, in, at the company. And at that time, like that was five years ago, Zenders had 150 employees. Now they have 1,200. So they grew like crazy. They doubled customers, income, employees like every year. Uh, so, um, I could, you know, I always said if I had found a job offer for managing a gorilla park in Congo, I also would have said yes, right? It was just for the story uh, because back in the days there was this, you know, the moth podcast where they, yeah. where they talk about stories and somebody, I think there was a live uh, slam in Chicago and the guy who started the podcast said, sometimes I think the best way of making decisions in life is to choose the option which has the most anecdotal value right for me it was all about these anecdotal value like this is a cool story man i just searched for coolest job on the internet and now i have a job i have to do this just for the story right so i can be on your podcast now <laughs> so i'm working my off and um after a year and a half i had a friend who who was like on the brink of suicide because he was like in a top management position at a, at, a, at a French car manufacturer and he was working so much and had so much pressure in his, in his life. But he was also this perfectionist, this neurotic perfectionist that he developed a tin tinnitus, you know, this ringing of the ear, like oh, this yeah. constant. Yeah. And he had that for 18 months. So he didn't sleep well, right? He slept for like two hours every night and, I can understand how that brings you to the edge of suicide. You know, it's like having a crazy hangover for a year straight. And he tried everything to get rid of that. And at one point, I met him after a long time not seeing him. And I said, dude, you should try something completely different. Just go change your environment. Go to the rainforest. Maybe meet some shamans or whatever. And he said, well, are you going to bring me there? And like, well, are you going to pay my flight? And he said, yes. So... I take all my vacations from the year and we fly to the Amazon rainforest and I, um, and I tell him uh, and, and I translate and I connect them with shamans and, 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 and participate in these sessions, you know, what now is very uh, popular with the Silicon Valley crowd. Uh, oh my gosh. Yes. We've <laughs> talked about that on this podcast before. Also, ayahuasca, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So at the, at there, I thought, man, I, I don't want to end up like this, but I was on the best way to end up like this because I worked like 100 hours a week and I loved it, but still I had no life. I had no lifestyle. I had a work style, basically. So I came back to Zendesk and I prepared the slide deck and I had like, I think four slides. One was, this is my time at Zendesk and a bunch of pictures. And then I said, this is what makes me happy and a bunch of, bunch of pictures, you know, which includes like jungle and guitars and TED conferences and, and all that. And I said, I have no time for this. So either I can do what I always do, which is quitting my job and then go traveling, or we find some sort of middle way where I can still stay here, but travel at the same time. And, the, and my middle way was like, I work three days a week, but get the same salary. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. my, job, my boss was like, no way. <laughs> so another guy came up to me and said, dude, why don't you just open up a company and then you try to maintain the relationship with Zendesk and then maybe they can send you some customers. 
And I pitched that idea to the boss and they're like, yeah, you can do that. So then I suddenly was the CEO and founder of, of Helpunder.it, which is a service provider for uh, these cloud-based customer service tools, mainly working with Zendesk. So in the beginning, especially, Zendesk sent me a bunch of customers, which was great because the customers go to Zendesk, they trust Zendesk, and then Zendesk tells them work with Fabian. So they trust me, I don't have to do a lot of the sales pitch. Um, and this was three years ago. So I have my three year anniversary now with the company and uh, doing really well, right? I'm just basically doing uh, all these data migrations from, from anywhere in the world. Um, I've been in, in, in 60 countries since I have the company. Uh, and a, you know, a half year into the company, I was sitting in my office in Berlin and I had just employed the first, the first employee, for which I met in a car sharing trip in, in Romania. And he, was, he moved into my living room. So I was in the office and he was in my living room. And then I felt really bored because I like when things are full of surprises and I can't foresee what's going to happen in the future. So I was sitting there and was thinking, yeah, now I could employ more people. I can make a bunch of money. But that's boring because I already know that it will work. right? So uh, I have this friend who drove a Land Rover through Africa for like six years and then ended up in China after six years. And I wrote him a message on Facebook and I said, dude, what should I do with my life? And he didn't say anything. He only sent a link to a Land Rover, which was for sale in Buenos Aires in, in Argentina. And he said, buy this Land Rover. And I'm like, why should I buy this Land Rover? And he's like, well, you, you, you buy it and then you see what you're going to do with it. And you're like, okay. So I was like, huh, maybe we can manage the company from the Land Rover because then it's full of surprises again. So I walk into the living room where Dominic sits, my first employee, like, hey, Dominic, do you want to manage the company from a Land Rover while we cross South America? And he looks at me and it's just like, sure. So two months later, we go, we're in Buenos Aires buying this Land Rover, which has like this flexible roof where you can sleep in. And we started this, this mission, which was crossing Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, uh, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, uh, and managing our company from, from the car. Uh, you know, with daily calls with customers. I was going to say, with internet? Like, how do you... Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I get it. And, and the second mission was to, to film a video documentary about people who we call the Che Guevara's of work, right? People who redefine work, like working from co-working spaces, coming on a skateboard to work, no bosses, no nine to five, no hierarchy. And we, we, we made a documentary about this, and that's Startup Diary. So you can see these, these video episodes on, on our blog. Um, so, and it worked. I mean, it was super stressful because we even didn't, we didn't know how to make a video documentary and had to learn all that stuff. And we worked like eight hours in Berlin a day. And now we had like two or three hours for the same workload because we had to do so much other things. And the car broke down, we had to drive uh, 15,000 miles and all that. But we learned by, by using the right tools. Uh, we learned to save a lot of time. You know, just, just, just one example. Let's say client wants to schedule a call. Right? And he's saying, hey, Fabian, I need a call. And then I'm like, hey, are you in PST, EST, GMT minus two? What are you? So then he's like, PST. And I'm like, okay, I go to my calendar. I have to subtract like nine hours to see when it fits. And it's horrible. And then he says, no, I can't at that time. And then he's just another time. And it's like six emails to get a call. So you know, we started using Calendly. Or you have other scheduling calls. No? Where you just send one link to the client. And then all the time zone calculations are gone. And you know, with one link, you have it. That's just one example. We, 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 we used uh, things like Alfred App, which is an amazing like, quick launcher for, for shortcuts and custom-made shortcuts. Uh, Alfred App actually shows you how many times per day you use a shortcut. And yesterday, um, I, gave, I gave a talk here in Mexico. We looked at the statistic. I use 140 shortcuts a day, you know, custom-made shortcuts. And you think, yeah, it doesn't save you too much time, but if you use it 140 times a day and, and every time you save like 10 or 15 seconds, it's, it's a lot of time. I didn't even but, know about that one. I'd like to be a geek. All right, I wrote that one down too. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I give this workshops for companies to how, to how to save like an hour a day by using all these shortcuts and it, it really works. Like somebody told me, man, the day I installed Alpha app was like meeting my wife. <laughs> Best testimonial ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. well, it depends on the wife, I guess. Good point, valid point. <laughs> or sad, very sad. I wanted to deinstall it after a week. <laughs> no. That's awesome. Oh, that's crazy. Okay, so there's so many questions that I have on this, uh, let alone the saving the hour a day. But it sounds like you really like uncertainty, which is awesome. But do you think the serendipity piece is because you're not attached 
to this stuff and you're just sort of going on the ride? Because I feel like a lot of people are attached. You're really quick at making decisions and going, mm. I'm just going to go here. I'm just going to go here because you're doesn't matter. But for a lot of well, other people, they're not like that. So, so is that something innate in you or do you think it's cultivated? I think it, 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 I, I'm, tra- I'm, I'm 35 now and I started traveling with 20. Like that was my first long-term travel trip to Thailand, right? And there's, there's, some, there's a great book by Rolf Potts called The Art of Long-Term World Traveling, which is amazing. And Tim Ferriss recommends that book a lot. Uh, it, it's really a, a great book to learn how to travel like a vagabond. It's called vagabonding, right? And, and you, have, you, know, you have vagabonds, you have, you have travelers, you have tourists, right? The tourists are in a group and they follow a guy and they don't go by themselves. You have travelers which follow everything that's living in the lonely planet. And then you have vagabonds who just you know, walk until the day becomes interesting. You just don't plan. You just sit around and see what happens. And since from early on I, I got into this environment, uh, like, like there's certain places on the world, like ma- I call them magic places where serendipity happens, like Morocco, or, or Thailand or, or, you know, Jamaica, where, where people are just hanging out and so they engage you in certain things. And I'm, I really like those, those non-planning planning trips where you just arrive at a place and then you just sit there and see who comes up and who offers you to, to go there or there and, and then the craziest things happen, right? And so I think I, from very early on in my life, I started living that way and that's why I was open, you know, because... It's one thing that you walk on, out of the office and you think, okay, I need to go home. And you're like a horse with these things on the side, right? You can only look straight. And another thing is, okay, I need to go home, but, you know, I enjoy the ride and see what's left and right. And then, you know, maybe you see a guy sitting on the street with long hair playing a guitar who tells you go to Africa. And then because of that, your life changes. Right? It's, I don't think it's magic. I don't think it's the law of attraction. I don't think that that exists. I think it's just how much you are open to confront yourself with um, many opportunities because if you confront yourself with many opportunities, the probability that one of those is good or great um, is higher. But right? anybody could have sat next to that backpacker and played the guitar and not made a decision right then and there to do something completely different and then just go back to what you normally do. So the fact that you're like, oh, and then two months later we did this. And then two months later, two months is a thing for you apparently. <laughs> two months later we, we just were doing it. So what what is that ability to go, I make a quick decision and I go after it and figure out the details later? Wow. Um, I, I think I, I would call it freestyle living or improvised, you know, spontaneous living. It's not having plans. It's, it's living in the presence, in the present, no? And, and not to be too focused on, 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 on the future. I don't know what that is. I don't know how it started. I just know uh, that it, it's always what changed my life in, in a positive manner was these serendipitous moments. And, you know, it's not easy. Like sometimes when I come back from one of these trips, many ex- expedition people they have this word called post expedition depression right imagine you're a rock band and you go on tour and then you come back home and you just sit there and nothing's happening right that happens to me a lot and and i always stress myself out like what's the next thing what i'm gonna do now where's the crazy stuff happening now and that doesn't work like always when i try to force myself to come up with the next idea it it didn't work it was just frustrating and i always knew like don't stress yourself just chill and then something's gonna fall from heaven and it always fell from heaven when I was just living in the moment. I don't know if, 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 if I'm just lucky. I guess not. I, I think luck is sort of is what, what you make of it. You know? it's, I don't think there's lucky people. And, and I think there's a great, there's a great experiment by um, Richard Wiseman, psychologist, who, who had 100 people. He, he took 100 people, like random sample from society, who said, we are always lucky. And then he took another 100 people who said, I'm never lucky. And he made this experiment. He gave everyone like a a newspaper. And this newspaper had, let's say, 143 pictures in it. The task was to count the number of pictures. The people who said, ah, three of the pictures had a subtitle, which said, if you read this text, you will get $100 from the guy who's running the experiment. It was not the task to read this text. But the people who said, I'm always lucky, significantly more reported to the guy was running the experiment that they read the text, then the other people who said, I'm never lucky. So it's not about I'm lucky and I'm not lucky by destiny. It's like, how much do you read between the lines? How much do you do things that you're not supposed to maybe, 
you know, like reading the subtitle, even nobody told you to do so. You know, maybe that's, and if you think about like, if you, if, 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 I think that's also from, from the four hour work week where, 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 where Tim Ferriss says fishing is best where no one goes, you know, like, like, let's say, let's say, um, if 95% do what you're supposed to, you know, what society tells you, you know, get, go to school, study, get a job, work until you're 65 until you're too old to spend all your money, no you know, <laughs> if, if you're, if you're part of the 5%, who doesn't, who don't do that, mm. it automatically means that the competition is lower, right? Because you're now competing for, with 5%, not with a 95%. So being different or kind of weird and strange helps sometimes, you know, and doing things uh, asynchronously. It's like when you walk into a toilet, like a public toilet, and there's like four toilets. People usually think, okay, I think the first one must be the uh, dirtiest one. So they go to the last one, but it's actually the opposite, you know? Oh, I've <laughs> so, heard that before too. <laughs> Well, ask, so, let me ask you this, though, because I, I agree, luck favors the prepared mind. Everybody used to call me lucky. And I'm like, I just ask for more stuff. That's okay. Uh, but when you start asking people that are listening to do something that makes a difference, right? It's one thing to be like, oh, I'm just going to go on a crazy trip. A lot of people will be like, can't do that. So what's one thing that they can do that what might open up their senses a little bit more to this uncertainty? I feel like you have a trust in yourself uh -huh. that's just so like, I'll figure it out no matter what it is. Not only like, doesn't have to be trust in the universe. It's like, I'll figure it out. I'll be fine either way. Malaria, no big deal. Right. So, but, but what do people that are used to the planning, that are used to the checking the stuff off the list, what can they do? Like one or two things that would open them up a little bit. Well, first I would say like break your routine. As cliche as it sounds, get out of your comfort zone. You know, do things that you, that you never did before. Uh, like just, what? Because just... they'll probably sit there and be like, yeah, that sounds good, but I don't know. Well, you, you go to the web browser, you open meetup.com and you browse the things that are happening in the five uh, mile radius and then you just go to a random one. You did now you're going to meet people that you never met before because you're going to a place where there's people interested in something that you're not interested in and then you get a whole new perspective on, 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 on the world, you know, and this meetup is great for these things and it's, it's happening everywhere. Um, I think just confronting yourself with, with, with new opportunities, you know, it's just a numbers game. The more opportunities you confront yourself with, the higher the probability that one of them is, is great. Let me ask you this though, because we talk about opportunity versus distraction a lot. And the thing is we only have so much time, right? And we have goals because that's who we are normally, right? Quote unquote. And so we assume that this is a, a distraction right? Especially if we have too many opportunities, sometimes they look like opportunities and sometimes they're not really a good fit. So how do you determine the difference between the two? <laughs> I'm giving oh, you hard questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Flesh out exactly what all of this is in your brain now. Go. Oh, you know, that's really hard to answer because I don't think about these, those things. I don't wow. plan. I just go with, with the flow, you know? It's, uh, it's really hard. I think there's a TED talk from Martin Seligman, the guy with the positive psychology, where he talks about flow. No, these moments where you don't think about time, you don't even know what you're doing yeah. because you're so engaged in your activity. You know, like, like playing a violin, or, or uh, you know, that 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 you're not aware of, of things are happening. So I think for me it was always, what are the activities that I can do where I have these flow experiences, and then that's what I went with. But I, I don't have a recipe for for it. There's <laughs> a there's a great book coming out by Jamie Wheel called Stealing Fire. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's not out yet, but it talks about flow. He runs the Flow Genome Project. But uh -huh. what's crazy, though, is I feel like you're getting, you're finding flow in non-work related activities, which might sort of go into work related activities. Do you ever, do you find the flow within work at the same time, oh, yeah. too? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Tell totally. me about that. Well, when I worked at Zendesk, I actually walked up to my boss and I asked, can I live in the office? Because we had this this space where everybody was storing their their suitcases or something, and and I wanted to put a bed there because I wanted to work all the time. I loved it, right? And rent in London was really expensive, so <laughs> he said, "No, man, for 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 security reasons, you can't do that." Uh, but a couple of nights I slept in the office because I was so engaged. You know, I, I I like like I probably could hire someone who does what I do. Like I probably work like two or three hours a day because I learned to use all these tools in such an efficient way while traveling in South America because of the time pressure and work overload, that, no, that now I don't have this time pressure, but I can still use the same strategies and now I'd only have to work because of that two or three hours a day. So I could probably find someone who does that for me, but I love it so much, you know? I love 
being a geek and hacking away and, and doing some coding here and there, or, you know, having this black terminal with green letters, uh, which looks like the matrix. I need to see this every day and I love it. It's, it's Is like, that what you creating... use? that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it looks, it looks, it creates flow for me too. So yeah, I, I love the feedback from the customers. I, I'm always like responding emails super fast because I love how they come back and say, man, this is such a great service. And uh, I you like sound that. so delighted from everything, whether it be work <laughs> or, or fun or whatever it is. But when everybody's listening, I'm sure they're going, wait, I only want to work two to three hours a day. So give me, what are your top three tips on really trying to save that hour per day besides the Alfred app? Because we want to save as much time and be in the flow as much as humanly right. possible. So I think the philosophy, the philosophy behind, on a meta level, behind Alfred App is, let's say you're a carpenter, right? If you're a carpenter in Germany, you have to go to make a three-year apprenticeship where you learn how to use your saw, right? And you learn what the buttons are for. Now, if, you, if you're somebody who uses a computer for more than two hours a day, it really makes sense to know how to use this computer. But we, we don't learn how to use a computer, right? We, we, we open it and then we learn by doing, which is great. But there's certain things which can save you so much time. Like everybody on the world, even my mom knows how co command C, command V works, like copy and paste. But there's just as many as shortcuts, which are just as useful, which nobody knows. You know, so I would say learn how to use your tools and starting with the computer, right? Every time you're sitting at the computer and you're doing something again, like a repetitive thing, if you catch yourself doing something over and over again, then there is a better way. There's a more efficient way. You know, sometimes you can use shortcuts, which are already there. Sometimes you can use a tool like Alfred App to set up a custom shortcut. Here's an example. So a friend of me, we are having this competition where we do 10 minutes of exercises uh, every day, like, like barely exercise. And we have a spreadsheet where we put in our progress. Like every day we have to put what we eat and how many exercises we did. On the same time, when I open the spreadsheet, I need to open the video of the girl who's doing the exercise so I can follow them. So imagine how many actions that takes, right? Open the browser, go to drive.google.com where the shared spreadsheet is, search for the spreadsheet, click on it to open it, right? Then you have that thing. Now you have to go to YouTube, search for this exercise video, open it, put it like next to the spreadsheet. It's like 10 actions. I have a shortcut, but the only thing I do is command space EX and it auto completes the exercise. I hit enter. The spreadsheet's open on the left side of the screen. The video opens on the right side of the screen. Done, right? It's like one action compared to 10. So I have like 250 of these shortcuts, which I set up while I was in the desert in Peru because my friend was driving and I was sitting there. We had no internet, so I had nothing better to do to create all these shortcuts. But it only takes you a day to set up all these shortcuts for the repetitive things you do in your daily uh, activities, and then you save time for the rest of your life. If so you shortcuts. remember them all, I feel like that's the one thing. Now I have to remember 250 shortcuts. That seems like that's crazy, or not that many, but you know what I mean. Is it not hard really. to try and do that? No, because let's say you have one which is called exercises, right? You know that you're going to do exercise. All you do is EX and then it autocompletes, right? If you have others, you know more or less what you're searching for and it autocompletes. Alfred Up gives you these suggestions. Another example, let's say you have to schedule a call tomorrow at 3 p.m., uh, or let's say you have to meet somebody tomorrow at 3 p.m. at Union Square. Now you can go to your Google Calendar, click on 3 p.m., create an event, put in the details. It's, it's like six actions, right? I, with Alfred App, you do Cal, meet Lauren tomorrow 3 p.m. at Union Square. It automatically adds that thing in your Google Calendar at 3 p.m. It automatically takes the part at Union Square and puts it in the where, uh, in the location thing, right? It, it's, it's a little that thing. Makes sense. It's, the same uh, for task managers, like Wunderlist, you know, Wunderlist yeah. task manager. I just do WL, like Wunderlist, uh, call customer X tomorrow at 9 p.m., remind me 15 minutes before per SMS, and then I get an SMS 15 minutes before, and it's just like one command, which I type in in 10 seconds. Instead of opening Wunderlist, go there, at the task, at a time, at a reminder 15 minutes before. It's these little things, and you learn them once. Maybe it takes a day or two. But once you have them, it serves you for the rest of your life. So I'm a, I'm a big shortcut guy. If you could see my command button now, I, I unfortunately can't do that. But the command button is the only button on my keyboard, which has no key. Like this, the C and D is gone. <laughs> <laughs> so I use my Amazon Echo a lot. Like there's a lot of little things that you can say voice command wise that yeah. that's been really helpful and saved a little bit of time anyway. I feel like it's kind of a pain for me to try and set things up like that. What's another thing that people can do to save time? 
Um, well, tools in general, like Calendly, like for scheduling, it, it depends what you do, right? I, I do a lot of data migrations. So when I have calls with customers, I ask them the whole, uh, the same questions over and over again. Like what system are you migrating from? Is it Salesforce? Is it Freshdesk? How many tickets do you need files, whatever? It's like 15 questions, which are always the same. So why would I do those calls? What I did is we created a tool, which is like, it says, it needs 1.5 minutes of your time. And we know everything we need to know to give you a quote. They click on this click through step-by-step -step wizard. It's like eight steps. And they only click, I need this, I need that, I need this. And at the end, they put in the email. We get a summary, they get a summary, and we can quote, we can send them a quote. Because if, you, if you're like a nomad company like, like we are, having calls is the worst thing. You need a stable location, you need good internet, and you need to be there at a specific time, which is the worst to do if, you, if you're like traveling through the desert, right? So we, we, we just, tr th th this is the, I think the takeaway because of this pressure and the constraints that we had in South America, we were forced to develop those tools. So it might also be a good idea sometimes to get into these positions where you have those constraints because then you have to force yourself no matter what you work more efficiently. Hmm. I love it. Yeah, I'll do these interviews from remote location on not live. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so, but I mean, I think that's the funny thing. There's some things that we could definitely do. And be, you being a computer programmer makes it way easier because you're like, oh, I'll just create a program for that. It's not that big of a deal. Whereas somebody that actually needs something like that has to go and be like, oh, no, I have to hire somebody and do something like this, which is kind of a pain. But it's still right. worth it because if you save yeah. that much time, you don't have to do any phone calls Yeah. out of the well, whole year. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. And for, for everything I mentioned, the only thing you need to be a programmer for is the last thing I mentioned, where we yeah. built this tool, right? For everything else, you, you don't need to be a programmer for. But even if you're not, you go to Upwork, you hire some guy in Eastern Europe who for $8 a day develops your tool and you probably pay him 16 hours and then it's done. Heck, you could use Wufu or like uh, Google Docs and have a form too. It's not like you need you know <laughs> something crazy in order to get some information from people. Right, exactly. Okay, so I love this. I know we have to start wrapping up, but can you give me one, what's one other thing that you give um, when you do these talks for people to try and save them or at least think differently on saving time? Because time is such a big deal and I feel like we just do the normal productivity stuff that doesn't really always help anymore. Well, I guess the, the typical Tim Ferriss rant, right? If, if you're sitting in an office and you're employed and you know you're gonna leave the office at, at five, no matter what, no matter how fast you work, uh, you will not focus on the task and, and, make, and, and finish it in the most disciplined way because you have to sit there until five anyway. So if you have a task which takes usually two hours if you work with a super uh, uh, focus, you stretch it until five. If you're your own boss, then you know if I finish this task now in two hours, after when it's done, I can, you know, in our case, jump into the waterfall in Colombia or, 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 or interview somebody. But I guess the, the vision, no? if, 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 you, if you have something nice to do when the task is done, you, you probably that helps to do it with more focus. No? So just getting rid of this nine to five mindset um, helps. Um, then I, I think I mentioned the other things that, well, you know, there's, there's things that if you read the four hour work week, you get all this now, like the Pomodoro technique, you know, like having um, 20, 25 minutes of focused work, knowing that then you have a five minute break where you can check Facebook or call your grandma or whatever, and then have another 25 minutes of focused work and then another break and then you have a longer break, you know, and gamifying it, you know, mm -hmm. like um, I never did exercise and I had terrible back pain at one point. Um, and then I used the 10 hour, uh, the, the 10 minute workout app, which is like a game you know, you do exercise and then you are unlock new trainings if you did the exercise for 30 days straight. And that was the only thing that made me do exercise, like, like having this reachable goals. Like now I'm writing a book and um, I cannot just sit down and write a book. I, I'm just too overwhelmed because it's so much. But I'm using a tool now, which is like 750 words a day. So uh, whenever the, the seven, I have a counter, I need to see this progress. I need to see the, the bar like filling up. And when it's 750 words, it turns green and then, you know, I'm done for the day. And, and then I see a statistic, how I did, and I feel really bad if on one, one day the, the, the curve is low. So the, the, like breaking bigger goals into smaller achievable ones, I guess, helps. Uh, as Tim Ferriss would say, make it a game, make it competitive, and make it measurable. No? So if making it competitive would be, I'm writing a book with someone. So if this someone sees yesterday I didn't write, she would like call me out on on it and, and, and that's making it competitive. No? I love that. And I feel like we forget those pieces, that accountability, but also making it fun. 
I'm yeah. a huge fan of competition, so I want to win at pretty much all costs. So yes, using that <laughs> against myself seems like the best thing in the world. I have a lot of my clients do toggle.com, T-O-G-G-L.com. So when they time yeah. themselves, you're just more focused because of that. You know what I mean? Because you're like, oh yeah. crap, <gasps> this is taking forever. All right. right. I really appreciate that. We're going to put all the um, all the resources you mentioned, and now I have to go download Alfred as soon as humanly possible because I literally use so many things, and I'm just thinking right now how much time that'll save me. So I'm going to ask you the last question I always ask, and it's what's one thing listeners can do this week, I know, to help move forward to their goal of a million? Oh, man. <laughs> Well, I would. Can, is there time for a little story? Yes, go ahead. All right. So I'm in Canada. It's the coldest winter in years. And I'm like, this is too cold. So I take a last minute trip to Jamaica. I get out in Montego Bay, drive a bus to Arturias. I'm in a hotel because I got the hotel with a deal for 450 Canadian dollars, like a flight in the hotel. It was amazing. First time I, I'm in this package deal. So I'm sitting there. And there's this Canadian couple my age, and I'm saying, yeah, I'm going out. And they're like, you're going out? Out of the gate? It's dangerous. And I'm going out, and it's not dangerous at all. And I have the time of my life. Now, there apparently is this amazing waterfall, Duns River Falls, right? And everybody, like a bus comes into the hotel compound. They pick up the tourists. They drive them to the waterfall. And I, I walk there because I can't do that. And then I'm the only one in the waterfall because I arrive first in the morning. So I go to the ticket counter, and they say, hey, uh, where's your guy? And like, guide? Yes, you don't have a guide? Well, you then better come, wait until there's a group so you don't slip and break your legs because it's dangerous. And I, uh, right. <laughs> so I buy the ticket, go in there. And I sit there and then all these masses of tourists come and they're like in groups of 10 people and they all have the Rastafarian guide and they're all like, hey, when you're in Jamaica, we always see Yaman. So I go like one, two, three, and you all go Yaman. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching all these groups asynchronously shouting Yaman. And I'm like, what the, you know, what is happening here? So we're at the foot of the waterfall, and it's like this cascading long waterfall, like 300 meters, but with cascades. So everybody is led by this shop where you have to buy like $10 rubber shoes so you don't slip. The guides are barefoot, and they run up the waterfall. All the tourists, even in much better shape than I am, they buy all these $10 rubber shoes, right? So then they say, hold each other's hand, and in a long line of like 200 people go up the waterfall, and everybody's like taking these baby steps and, and being afraid of dying in this waterfall, which is not really dangerous at all. So I'm there barefoot with backpack on, and I said, man, I'm going to do it like the guides do it, right? And I feel a bit weird because I'm the only guy who's like walking like this where everybody else is like holding hands and going in a line. And first I feel like slippery, and it's a bit risky. Um, and... I have to bear with the with the strange looks of the people in the line, but then I get into it. Like I get into this flow of climbing the waterfall, right? And I and I go like left and right. I discover all these lagoons. I see these giant butterflies. I see like this green tree frog, and I have the time of my life, right? But I'm far away from the line. And at that moment, I had this this I, I had this philosophic thinking going on that this waterfall is a representation of how society works, right? You have a line of people which follow what the other people say. And that's why they stay exactly in that line and hold each other's hand and go up and they don't see anything. But then you have some weird people who take a bit more risk. But if you imagine there's a hundred treasures hidden in the waterfall, like separately, randomly, where's the probability higher that you find these treasures? Is it in the line where, where there's 600 eyes looking left and right? Or is it when you walk left and right to all these different places? It's probably higher when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're the other guy, right? Everybody reaches the top of the waterfall, I guess, which, which you can maybe can compare with, with death. <laughs> but the question is how, right? And I think, you know, for me, the, the answer to your question is well, comp go out of the line. Uh, see the things that are happening left and right. Don't do the, only what society uh, suggests to do and, uh, you know, make your own climb. <laughs> I love that. I love that story. I got goosebumps. You can actually see them. So, uh, so everybody that just listened to that story, think of one thing that you can do to shake the heck out of what you're doing right now. Because I feel like we do get so ingrained. Even when I was telling, I spoke in Thailand not that long ago, and everyone's like, oh, "You're going to Thailand because right now it's not really the best time." And blah blah blah. Like that's what I heard from absolutely everybody that I talked to, and it's not a big deal. Like it's so funny how we think the sky is falling from the silliest things. You're gonna slip. Yeah, if you die, whatever. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but thank you so you much. I want. Die. Well, everybody's gonna die anyway. Eventually, <laughs> doesn't really matter. 
how you live when you're here, right? Uh, and it sounds like you're living in delight literally like all the time. It's so amazing to listen to you speak, which is uh, eye-opening because a lot of people, we do gratitude lists in the morning. You know, we've got our five-minute journal where everybody talks about this stuff. And I feel like it seems like you're just in it all the time, which is really <laughs> refreshing to see because it's uncommon. So tell us where we can find uh, more about you, where we can go to your website and check it out if we do need to do any migration, any of that fun stuff. <laughs> so um, if you want to follow our adventures of being a nomad company crossing South America in a uh, broken down van, you can go to startupdiaries.org and you see 10 uh, video episodes of our adventures. If you need a data migration uh, from Zendesk to, to anything or, or vice versa, go to helppanda.it. And if you want to know about me personally and the book I'm going to uh, publish soon, it's fabianditrich.com. It's a bit hard to spell, but I guess you can link it up somewhere. We will definitely link to it. I love how diverse your links are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show, Fabian. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And make your own climb. You're only going to die. <laughs> Thank you for listening and investing in yourself with your time. I so appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this episode, I would be forever grateful if you would be willing to leave a rating or review in whatever app you use for your podcast. I know that's what really bumps it up in the rankings. And I would so appreciate your time, especially if you've been a long time listener. But of course, if you like this episode and you're brand new, thank you for being here too. Have an amazing, amazing day.